Uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day two of the conference. Uh, thank you for joining us again today. Um, for our, our keynote, opening keynote, I don't think we'd have many more people qualified to give this keynote within the industry. Um, it's a pleasure to be introduced, Fasant Dar, who is a professor at Stern School of Business and the Center for Data Science at NYU and founder of SCT Capital Management. Bassant will be delivering a keynote uh, today around AI and finance, opportunities and challenges, and he'll be taking questions at the end of the session. So please do put questions in the chat and I will put them to Bassant at the end of the session. Bassant, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me uh, start my screen share and get this started. So, um, uh, I've been in the uh, business of using machine learning and capital markets uh, probably longer than uh, anyone else, certainly longer than most people I know. Uh, and what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes or so is just summarize uh, some of the key takeaways from my experience in implementing machine learning in capital markets. Um, and I'm going to leave about 10 minutes uh, open for questions. So feel free to uh, jump in after that. And if there's anything, um, Else you'd like to know, uh, I'm easy to reach. Uh, and if you want details of my trading program, um, happy to, to share that as well. So, you know, what's the skinny on machine learning and capital markets? Um, you know, and the obvious questions are, you know, is machine learning useful in asset management? And the answer to that is yes, it is. But the real question is when and how? Uh, what does machine learning bring to the table? Well, it brings large, uh, the ability to deal with large and heterogeneous data sets that traditional methods are less well suited for. Uh, it gives us potentially higher accuracy. Um, and this comes about because of the flexibility it provides in the modeling, uh, you know, sort of allows a much more facile way of modeling nonlinearities and sort of it frees us from the assumptions about the data generating process, which are, uh, you know, endemic to other methods, uh, you know, traditional statistical methods. But you don't get something for nothing. So what's unique about capital markets? Well, there's several things, uh, but let me point out the two key uh, distinguishing aspects of capital markets that make machine learning unique and challenging, um, you know, in, in, a, in a specific way. One is, non-stationarity. And what that really says is that you can't assume a simple data generating process like most other methods do, um, such as you know, use it uh, in uh, vision and language. And what that really boils down to is that it requires a different mindset towards data and formulation. And the mindset really is that there isn't typically sufficient training data. That is, there aren't sufficient relevant training examples that, that, that are not, they're not abundant, unlike other areas of AI, such as vision and language, where data are abundant, right? You can have, you know, lots of data about stop signs and images and all that kind of stuff. Again, language, you know, tons of it for machines to learn from. Whereas in finance, the, you know, the, the, that's the problem is, is the, uh, the, the, the lack of sufficient training data and it also requires a different attitude towards sort of yeah, and this is sort of an accompanying problem towards noise and an acknowledgement of regimes and deep domain thinking and and regimes sort of enable us to uh you know better make use or, or uh, yeah make better use of the limited training data that we have um and it's basically a mindset that says you've got to be stingy about data and you have to model for change which is unique, you know, relative to other problems that assume a stationarity that, you know, you converge on uh, a problem over time, right? That you sort of hammer away at it and you get better and better and better. No such luck here. You, you essentially have to plan for change, which makes it particularly challenging. The other aspect is that it's a competitive zero sum nature of financial markets, right? To have something that works, it tends to sort of get washed away, right? So there's you know, not too many opportunities for, you know, sort of a free lunch. And the other way to put it is that pure alpha, other than let's say high frequency trading, uh, is really hard to find. So it's elusive. And what that means is that you have to be sort of uh, clear about the risk 
that you're taking, right? All of these strategies take risk in one form or the other, and one has to be really cognizant about what kind of risk is your strategy really taking. Um, and the other aspect of the sort of competitive nature of markets is that, you know, buying in bulk doesn't get you a discount. It's just the opposite, right? So the more you want to trade, the larger you want to do it, you don't get a discount, you actually get penalized for it. So the, you know, the moment you try and scale, friction begins to get in the way. Um, and, you know, like I said, there's a need for models to evolve over time. Now, I'll just point to a special issue on machine learning in, in capital markets um, by the Journal of Investment Management that came out last summer. Um, it had uh, an introduction by Charles Elkin. Uh, there was a paper by myself and Hao Yan Yu, my chief scientist, uh, about sort of stability of machine learning models in financial markets. Um, there was a paper by Roman Israel, Brian Kelly, and Tobias uh, Moskowitz about you know, whether machines can learn finance and the associated question about um, you know, the problems uh, with limited data and how you get machines to sort of capitalize on the limited data that you have and use existing theory in the process. There was a paper by Sanjeev Das and Subir Varma about creating wealth with the intention of reaching a certain target as opposed to maximizing wealth. Uh, and another paper by Peter Carr and his co-authors about predicting the variance of the S&P 500. Um, some of the uh, broad points I've made are actually really well summarized in this uh, journal uh, in the various articles that I mentioned. And last summer, um, in response to sort of, you know, what I saw a big hype around AI, I also wrote an article, um, an opinion piece uh, in MarketWatch about AI and when investors uh, should trust uh, AI. Uh, so that's sort of a more of a popular piece. So, um, and, and one of the things I wrote about in that is just sort of this relationship be between, you know, expectations of performance and size and how, you know, size sort of gets you towards the market fairly quickly, right? So by the time you get to, you know, a few, you know, a billion or so in AUM, it just becomes much harder to achieve, you know, uh, high information ratios, unlike high frequency trading, uh, you know, where, you know, you can get sort of obscene performance. I mean, I, I did HFT for several years, you know, and my strategies are the sharp ratio of 12, which, you know, but they wouldn't scale. On the other hand, I run a machine learning program now that has an information ratio of one, but that's much more scalable. Uh, but that's sort of, you know, the relationship between size uh, and expected performance um, that I point out in the market watch piece. So I'll just say a, a little bit about my own research in capital markets. Uh, and present sort of, you know, some of the challenges I've encountered and then just sort of throw it open for questions. So uh, what I've tried to do is quantify the impacts of uncertainty on the machine learning process. Um, and this is uh, as a function of the problem. And I view problems as sort of lying on a spectrum of predictability from sort of complete noise to you know, complete determinism. So, you know, and, and, and people in AI tend to think of this as sort of, you know, the Bayes error rate, you know, is the term that's used, uh, where on, you know, complete certainty, you know, you, you never get anything wrong and complete randomness, you can never predict anything. But every problem lies on the spectrum. And I try and quantify this. So whenever I look at a problem, including, uh, you know, capital markets, I sort of have this uh, desire to say, where does this lie on the spectrum? Um, and then what I want to do is design algorithms that generate the kind of behavior that I want from the program. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. And what this really comes down to is the way I look at this is, uh, I look at this in terms of constraint-based machine learning. So essentially, you know, and, I, and I'm sure that you've all tried this at home and encountered the same thing, right? If you point a machine learning algorithm of the data, you know, it, it, guess what it'll do? You know, it'll essentially give you beta, right? It'll, it'll, it'll tell you, it'll learn trend following, for example. Uh, but, and, and that's fine, you know, trend following is a great method, but, you know, after all that huffing and a puffing, if, you know, your machine learning algorithm learns trend following, you know, you can say, well, okay, I could have told you that, right? And so I don't really want that, right? And yet, 
that's what the algorithm will give me because you know the properties of that model are what I desire, right? Is it stable? You know, is it accurate, right? And it's essentially going to say, hey, this is the best I can do, but that isn't what I want. And so what I want to do is I want the, you know, I want to sort of focus the algorithm. I want to drive it into generating the behaviors that I need. And this problem, by the way, is is, is quite general. It's, it's not unique to capital markets. Like people in, let's say, fairness and ethics talk about, you know, creating behaviors of, from algorithms that are fair. Ultimately, it sort of comes down to the same thing. You want the algorithm to behave in a way that you desire, not in a way that it wants to behave uh, based on the data that it's seeing. So it, it's a subtle but significant difference from sort of standard unconstrained machine learning that you that that we typically see um, and and of course what i want like i said is stability what i call sort of low model variance so i can trust the machine right so what do i mean by stability and low model variance now this is different from performance variance and this came about you know from my research about 10 years ago uh, where I realized, or a little more than 10 years ago, actually, where I realized that for different problems, uh, slight changes in the training set could actually produce significant changes in the decision-making of the system. I'm not talking about behavior, I'm talking about decision-making, right? So if I train a system on slightly different data sets, is it gonna make the same decisions? Now in perception, like vision and language, the answer is yes. Those models are incredibly stable because there's solid ground truth, there's very high predictability. And so people don't worry that, you know, will the algorithm one day tell me I'm looking at a tree and the next day it's gonna tell me it's an elephant. That, that, you don't expect that kind of instability in, in vision systems, right? There's, there's a tremendous amount of stability. And yet in finance, we don't get that. We don't have the luxury of that because these problems tend to be noisy. And so you tend to lose stability. So the problem becomes, uh, how do I get stability and accuracy you know, at the same time and actually get the machine to generate something that's different from beta? And that's sort of in, in a nutshell been you know, my you know, quest for um, finding, for harvesting alpha in the machine learning space. Uh, I do also uh, advise you know, companies in the fintech space. For example, I'm doing some work in, in, in real estate. Um, Problems, they have higher uh, signal, but we still have the same problem to a, to a lesser degree of like, you know, not enough training data and the ability or, or the need for the models to exhibit high stability or, or what I call low model variance. Um, now I'm just gonna, uh, I've given myself seven minutes to, to um, um, uh, make this uh, to, to end. So I'm gonna fly through the next few um, charts, but these are in the article in the special issue, uh, you know, so you can, uh, so you have access to that and you can look at that. But essentially, I look at problems on this predictability spectrum, uh, and I have this framework on when we should trust the machine. And the, you know, the, the, the takeaway is you trust the machine when predictability is high and error costs are low. Uh, when predictability declines, we require that the error cost be low in order to, tr to trust the machine, right? So this is sort of a simple way of looking at, you know, when we're willing to cede control of decision-making to the machine. And I sort of came up with this framework and I realized that, you know, I was willing to trust the machine with making trading decisions, but we don't trust machines with sort of driving us around or with making medical diagnoses because the costs of error are too high. So um, um, I'll, I'll just, skip this one, that's just sort of a landscape of problems in finance. But I wanna present some, uh, just sort of uh, give a summary of some of the results that I've done from experiments where I varied the predictability of problems and the base rate. That is how often does the phenomenon of interest occur? And as a function of these two, how does my performance and its variance change? And uh, essentially what I'm doing is, um, trying to predict how often I, uh, well, a number of things. One is like, how often do I predict the minority class? And this is a, a really interesting result I wanna spend a minute on, which is that, um, if you, so I've got a predictability on this x-axis and I've got the prediction rate of the minority class on the y-axis, right? So, and, and so uh, this blue line means 
means that the uh, classes are balanced, 50-50, high-low, up-down, whatever. Um, you know, whereas O1 means I only have 1% of the minority class, right? So low base rates, much harder to predict. Um, and what this is essentially saying is that, you know, the takeaway from this is that, you know, for problems with low signal, so, you know, let's say trading in capital markets lies sort of, you know, somewhere here on this predictability spectrum. And so the key takeaway is that the, the bias that is, you know, in the, in the base rate actually gets amplified by the learner and predictions get skewed towards the majority class in inverse proportion to predictability. Now, there's a lot in that statement, but, you know, it sort of makes total intuitive sense once you, once you think of it. And that's sort of the reason why a machine learning program ends up learning beta or trend following. It sort of amplifies the bias and gets you there, right? So that's sort of the takeaway from this. Um, and, um, you know, some of the other takeaways really quick are that, so this is the good news, which is that for balanced problems, even for low signal problems, you can actually start better, doing better than random, even at like, you know, like a 5% signal, you know, you can start doing better for balanced problems, but it's harder for unbalanced problems, like skewed problems, where you have to have much higher predictability to see them get off the ground and start doing better than random, right? So these are two like really interesting takeaways. Um, so lower base rates require much higher predictability to do better than random. So in terms of stability, right? I want stability. So the question is, you know, what is the model variance? And this is something I've modeled across predictability, across base rates. Um, and in my case, I looked at sort of the variance of the performance, that is the variance of the recall. Um, and um, I'm not gonna go through this. This is just an example of, you know, three different um, uh, learners based on slightly different variations on the training set and how their predictions are different. And in this case, I have a method for computing uh, model variance. Um, and this is sort of the landscape, which basically shows that the variance actually um, uh, goes up, um, you know, with, uh, you know, higher base rates, it goes up with lower predictability, as you'd expect. This result here is a little uh, more counterintuitive, but I'm not going to get into that, but this makes total sense. Um, and then um, the performance uh, goes up, as you would expect, with higher signal and higher base rates, nothing surprising here. Uh, what's interesting here is the performance variance here is, again, as you'd expect, higher for lower base rates, uh, you know, despite higher signal levels. Uh, but I'll leave it at that and just try and conclude um, with the following observations. That is, that machine learning provides the potential for capturing interaction effects and non-linearities, non but there's no free lunch. Uh, the training data are inherently limited. The additional complexity um, that, is, that is introduced potentially includes or induces more variability and therefore higher uncertainty, which is something that I've been trying to deal with in my training program. Uh, and what I've tried to do is quantify uh, these trade-offs as, uh, as a way of coming up with algorithms that sort of arrive at this optimal bias variance trade-off, which is implemented in the strategies that I trade at the moment. Um, and most importantly, uh, what it gets me is to the point where I can give investors what they want and not beta, which isn't what they need and which they're getting in gobs from every other place, right? So that's, to me, the, the real challenge of machine learning is to find that sort of residual, uh, you know, smart beta, or if you're lucky enough, uh, some alpha. Um, and... Uh, you know, the other takeaway is that these operators of AI systems need to make critical choices about trade-offs and not all AI systems are the same. I'll just end with a couple of uh, thoughts, which is, you know, what are the open questions around the human machine interface? And this is something I faced last March, actually, with COVID, where the question to me was, you know, was there a, a, a sort of a massive change in markets where, um, you know, all bets were off. And was that grounds for intervention, right? Because the whole idea with the machine is if you've done the math, you've done the science, then you should trust the machine uh, because the machine should, you should expect to do better than 
you know, humans making judgments. But the, the, the real sort of general question is when is machine better than human plus machine? And people assume that human plus machine is better, like the Kasparov you know, assertion that in chess, humans and machines will outperform machines. I'm not sure that's true in finance. In fact, I would take the counter position that actually humans mess up the machine, uh, except in you know, very special situations. And you know, one such situation was COVID, like what I call these edge cases. And of course the challenge is, how do you recognize that you're in an edge case? And that is you know, a real challenge. And I you know, wrote this uh, uh, piece called Algorithms in Crisis last year, where I talked about those edge cases where it's justified you know, for humans to intervene, but essentially to cut risk as opposed to taking more risk or override the machine's decisions. So, um, and of course, you know, one of the other questions is, you know, what does time pressure do uh, you know, to this sort of interaction between human and machine? All interesting uh, questions uh, for which we don't have solid answers at the moment. So let me uh, conclude here. And uh, I went a minute over what I'd intended, but that wasn't bad. So thank you, and I'll take questions at this point. Awesome, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. I'll, um, let, let's run through some of the questions we've had from the audience. So uh, Syed Fidel asks us, would synthetic data enhance the machine learning prediction? Well, potentially, uh, but you know, the, the question here becomes, you know, does the, you know, you know, what are you trying to do with the synthetic data? Are you trying to understand a concept like I was trying to do? So in my experiments, I use synthetic data because I wanted to quantify the relationship between predictability and variance, right? And I just don't have enough real world data to do that. I'd need, you know, decades of data to, to uh, you know, where enough natural experiments have occurred to be able to do that. So for something like that, I think synthetic data makes a lot of sense. But if you're trying to build a trading strategy, I'd say, you know, I'd be, uh, you know, more cautious about using synthetic data to do that because it just doesn't co correspond to reality. Yeah. Uh, next question: what, what would your advice be to smaller quant funds without the size and scale of of, of, of larger funds? Well, I think that. Um, you know, I mean, this is sort of an interesting uh, question in that uh, smaller funds face a challenge uh, attracting large investors. I mean, that's, you know, because people don't want to take career risk, right? So there, there's this sort of real conservatism in the industry to just go with the larger people, uh, uh, you know, and, and just sort of, you know, get that beta because, you know, you're not going to be fired for that. The challenge for smaller funds is really to demonstrate um, some sort of convincing alternative to the beta that people are getting in the market. And this, you know, it, it can't be just based on back tests alone. There has to be more. Uh, there has to be some real track record and, and, and some real demonstration of science that, that shows, you know, why this, you know, concept or, or whatever it is that you're sort of uniquely differentiating is for real. Uh, and that's the challenge. Uh, you know, convincing other people. And I face the same challenge myself, you know, in, in convincing the massive pension funds, you know, uh, you know, you know, to, to, to push the button. So um, yeah, that, that's a real challenge. Yeah. And uh, I, I suppose um, a question, question that, that's often asked is, is uh, there, there was a lot of hype around AI as a topic about four or five years ago. And now it's seen as kind of going through what the Gartner called the trough of disillusionment. Do you think we're through that now? And do you think we're, we're looking at real world implementation and success stories? Yeah, you know, I, um, that's a great question. And I've seen several sort of hype cycles and, and, and disillusionments. Um, I feel that the, the sort of AI uh, hype cycle, this stuff is more real. Um, that is, we, we, we do have better methods. We've made huge progress in perception and things like vision and, and language. Yeah. Um, and so that's different this time for sure. Um, I think the impact in finance has been less felt because the problems are different. The problems are harder. That doesn't mean it doesn't apply. It just means that it's much harder. Um, it also means that you know, 
as in previous hype, cycle, hype cycles, one has to be careful, right? That there's there's a lot of sort of hype around alternative data. Well, I shouldn't call it hype. You know, I think alternative data is is intriguing. It's seductive, yeah. but at the end of the day, it requires a lot of effort to do the inquiry and see whether there's actually value in that data. And that's what I found challenging. I've, I've tried several sources of alternative data and generally come up a little disappointed in how little it added to inputs such as prices that, that I was already using. So to me personally, after all of that, effort it's been a bit of a disappointment but you know as someone said you can't you can't afford to ignore anything these days you can't afford to ignore data so it just sort of raises the level of the playing field uh, for everyone great and uh, how can you apply machine learning model techniques to areas without adequate data well i mean that's kind of the the 64 dollar question right i mean uh, yeah. and that's what i talked about at the beginning that one has to have a different mindset you just have to be a lot more stingy towards data, you have to bring more domain knowledge to bear, you know, be cognizant about formulating the problem in, you know, ways that sort of take advantage of, you know, what we do know about finance, what we do know about regimes. Uh, and by regimes, by the way, I mean, you know, people use the word regimes in sort of a, a loose way. Uh, what I mean by regime is something where there's serial correlation, right? Where behavior actually persists uh, for a while. So volatility is a typical example of like one kind of regime, but there are other kinds of regimes that one can identify in markets if you think sort of more deeply about what's unique about finance. So the challenge is really to sort of think deeply about finance, recognize there's limited data and, you know, put those two together in, in a clever way so that you're being, you're being sort of stingy with how you use the data and, you know, the, the results you get are as robust as they can be, but acknowledge the inherent uncertainty that you're going to face going forward because it's a noisy problem, you know, and the fact that you're sort of modeling for non-stationarity. So all of these things make it, you know, particularly challenging. So, like I said, there's no free lunch here. Uh, it's a challenging problem. Um, is it addressable? Yes, I think it is. But one's expectations have to be modest. And you know, coming back to your hype sort of comment. That's sort of what it comes down to. I think, you know, people do a disservice by sort of, you know, um, I guess projecting a picture that, you know, AI is going to crack the market. No, it isn't. You know, it's, it's not going to crack the market. You know, if there was something to be cracked, it would have cracked it a while ago. Uh, markets change, right? One has to be creative and, and sort of look for these, you know, sources of alpha. You know, one of my favorite quotes is that patterns emerge before reasons for them become apparent. Uh, and that's the kind of thing one is really, you know, going for in, in capital markets and finance in general is the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that markets rhyme, but they don't, but, but the future is never the same as the past. It's always different. And that prevents uh, that, and that presents, uh, you know, unique sort of modeling challenges. Great. So um, we've got a couple of minutes left. I just want to ask one last question. Uh, you mentioned the fintech space. Are there any fintechs in, the, in this space currently you're quite excited about or any you see doing really innovative stuff? Um, well, you know, I'm uh, excited about fintech in general. Uh, you know, I, I'm excited about fintech and capital markets. Uh, you know, I'm you know, excited about what's happening in fintech in the retail space, uh, yeah. in real estate. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, some of the questions I've asked, for example, is, uh, you know, is gentrification predictable, you know, um, and that has implications for all kinds of things. Um, and people talk about the use of machine learning to answer these other questions in other domains, uh, which might then actually also be useful in capital markets, right? So, uh, and that's what sort of interests me about fintech is that it's technology applied to all areas of finance. And, you um, in some of these problems, there's more signal. So I find there's more signal in lending in real estate yeah. than there is in capital markets. Um, you know, but yeah, I, mean, I, I just find the fintech space uh, interesting and, and, and exciting in general for a number of reasons. Great. So, so, so do I. I think it's a fascinating space. Uh, Vasant, 
pleasure to host you. Fantastic to have you as our opening keynote. Thank you so much for the presentation and the chat with me just now. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure to be here, Lawrence. And thank, thank you, you everyone for tuning in. Thanks so